We get letters. We get stacks and stacks of letters. It's Tuesday, September 20th, 2022, and welcome back to Goodfellows, a Hoover Institution broadcast examining social, economic, political, and geopolitical concerns. I'm Bill Whalen. I'm a Hoover Distinguished Policy Fellow. I'll be your moderator today, and ordinarily we're joined by three good fellows, but one of our good fellows is missing in action. We're waiting for John Cochran to arrive, but we're going to start anyway. Joined as usual by the historian Neil Ferguson and the geostrategist Lieutenant General H.R. McMaster. They are both Hoover Institution Senior Fellows. Guys, we're doing something a little different today. We're going to go to the viewer mailbag, which we haven't done in some time. Uh, when we do this, by the way, it's a reminder that while we tape this show at various uh, various points in the United States, we're really an international show. We got responses. We got letters from people in 30 countries around the globe, six continents. We're waiting for that first elusive letter from Antarctica. So if you're on a weather station or watching the uh, ice pack melt, uh, get, drop us a line. We'd like to hear from you. So guys, if you're ready, let's get right to it. Uh, a question we have here from Cyril in London, who writes the following, quote, could Putin kill four birds with one nuke? Could he, if desperate for a win, use nukes on Ukraine to make Kiev capitulate, to deter NATO, to let the Chinese know that despite Russia's dependence on them, that Moscow was no vassal, and finally to deter his opponents in Russia by letting them know that he will do whatever it takes to keep power? Well, I'll go first, as I just was in Kiev, and that topic came up, the uh Ukrainians want us to think about this. They talk about the possibility of a, quote, limited nuclear war. Putin has rattled his nuclear saber uh, more than once since this conflict began back in February. And in a strange kind of way, as I think I said once before on this show, the better things go for Ukraine in the conventional war, uh, the more risky things get with respect to a non-conventional uh, nuclear or some other non-conventional response by Putin. Now, I think the probability of this scenario has gone down, uh, and it's gone down because things have gone so badly for Putin uh, in the last few weeks that he is beginning uh, to show real signs of wear and tear in the international arena. Point one, when I was uh, there in Kyiv, the Ukrainians were winning a famous uh, victory in uh, the east of Kharkiv, driving Russian forces back uh, a very long way. And uh, morale was, was at a high point uh, in Ukraine. But at the same time, we see, perhaps in response to that news, uh, Xi Jinping, the Chinese leader, Narendra Modi, the Indian leader, not to mention the Turkish uh, President uh, Erdogan, treating Putin with what can scarcely be called the respect uh, he as a ma mafioso has come to uh, expect. I think, and I've discussed this with a number of people far better qualified than me, uh, including a certain director of this uh, institution of ours, that if Putin were to give the order, Let's imagine a scenario where his army starts to unravel, as armies sometimes do if their morale is bad, which the Russian army clearly is. Let's imagine the army unravels not only uh, in Kharkiv, it starts to unravel in Kherson. They suddenly are being thrust back uh, into the Donbass. And Putin gives the order, fire a tactical nuclear weapon, drop one on some part of Ukraine. Does anybody carry that order out? Is there a right. Russian general will do that? And I think it's increasingly unlikely that that order would be obeyed. In fact, if Putin were to give that order, that might be the moment when it's Putin who suddenly falls through a Moscow window in mysterious circumstances. What do you think, HR? Hey, I agree with you, Neil. And, and I, I think that, you know, I think that Putin has to know that that if he uses a nuclear weapon of any size, you know, that it's a suicide weapon. I think, right. again, it goes back to discussions we've had previously. I think Putin has much more to fear from escalation than anybody else. Uh, and uh, and I think you're absolutely right. The trends are all in the right direction. I mean, I, I think if, if we want to make an analogy to our to our own revolution, it's October 1777, and the Ukrainians have just won the Battle of Saratoga, and I think you see the international support increasing as a, as a result of these recent victories around Kharkiv and in Kharkiv, uh, um, around Kharkiv. Mm -hmm. Gentlemen, we got a letter from Shervin in Redondo Beach, California, who writes the following, quote, 
Question for Professor Ferguson and General McMaster. Although it appears that the Russian army has suffered a major defeat near Kharkiv, it does not appear that the Ukrainians have captured many POWs. The Russian army may have lost many vehicles and artillery pieces, but if they still have their personnel, wouldn't the Russian army be able to bounce back similar to the Soviet army's resurrection after its defeats in 1942, where they lost ground but not soldiers like they did in 1941? Or do you think the growing reliance on modern armies on technology has made equipment more important than personnel? HR, why don't you take that? Well, that's a smart viewer, like all of our viewers, you know, <laughs> he's asking the right questions. And I think it is important, an important indicator to look for large numbers of surrendering Russians. And what you see the the, uh, the Ukrainians doing in, in, uh, in, in around Kharkiv is recognizing that mm-hmm. along that long defensive front, Russia can't be strong everywhere. And, and they haven't organized their defenses in depth. So what they've been able to do is conduct a penetration and turn that into a form of maneuver called a turning movement, where you get behind the enemy and then force the enemy to, to, uh, to, uh, to abandon prepared defensive positions. So a big indicator to watch, large numbers of surrender, surrendering Russians. Of course, in Kherson, it's much different. Uh, it's a much different form of maneuver. It's sort of a creeping infantry-based offensive based on the nature of the, of the terrain there. But again, that's a big indicator to watch. In terms of the regenerative capacity of Russia's war-making machine, uh, I think people are more important than equipment. But, you know, Russia can't do either. And, and what you see is a real struggle on the part of the Russians in trying to raise these volunteer battalions. And mm-hmm. because, because of the situation in Ukraine, they're not even sending them uh, into, into, uh, into the Donbass region because it's, it's a meat grinder. And so I think that Russia doesn't have a training base. There's not a Fort Benning, Georgia, you know, a Fort, a Fort uh, you know, a Quantico, Virginia, uh, to, to churn out trained Russian uh, infantrymen or, or armored vehicle crewmen. And I go back to the, the, the episode we had with Ben Hodges. When, remember, he was asked this question, hey, can, can Russia mobilize? And, and, and Ben said that you know, he had talked recently to the Finnish chief of staff. And of course, Finland has quite robust, very effective reserve system where they can call pretty much everybody uh, into, into, into national defense. And the Finnish chief of staff told him, hey, Putin can't do it because he'd be embarrassed. He doesn't have the equipment. He doesn't have the system to do it. So I, I think that the answer to the question, can Russia regenerate its war making machine is no. And, and, and but the viewer is quite right to look for the next big indicator that this that this counterattack turns into a, a decisive counteroffensive to regain the territory taken since February 24th is mm-hmm. our large numbers of Russians surrendering. Neil? I agree with everything HR said. I'll add a couple of points. The Wagner uh, mercenary group is recruiting in Russian prisoners. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, they are literally sending the dregs of Russian society uh, to fight this war. It's Squid Game Russian style. Uh, the, yeah, the, survive for six months and you can be free, right? Right. <laughs> uh, the, the second thing I'd say is, and this is me and my historian's role, not pretending to be a real general like HR, when, when armies uh, unravel, the incentive to surrender is a very important thing. When you have committed war crimes, as some Russian troops have, uh, it's quite risky to surrender. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I think that one reason we haven't seen large prisoner holes is that I don't think the Russians expect to be treated with kid gloves when they do surrender. So they ran away. Uh, So I think that's really important to watch. I heard in Kyiv that as soon as the Ukrainians took back territory, they sent in uh, their own police to make sure that reprisals against collaborators or Russian prisoners were not violent and summary. So there is definitely no love lost at this point between the Ukrainians and the Russians. In fact, to my amazement, uh, Ukrainian soldiers I met in Kyiv routinely refer to the Russians as the orcs. That's that's actually how they now talk about them. So. As you know, HR, uh, the decision to surrender uh, is based on a complex calculus. You have to ask yourself, will it be okay if I surrender? And one of the reasons World War II in that particular part of the world was so extraordinarily violent Mm -hmm. and had such astonishingly high casualties was that 
it was extremely dangerous to surrender. You, you know, if I can just share a quick anecdote, after we destroyed a, an Iraqi brigade in the 1991 Gulf War, we brought for, forward a psychological operations team with an Arabic speaker who said, hey, you fought with honor, you will be treated well, you know, please come forward and surrender. And, and we saw a small group came out of 77, well, not, I mean, substantial group of 77 came initially under a white flag uh, we 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 envision really in visual range of some of the other enemy. You know, we treated them extremely well. You know, we gave them food, we gave them water. You know, our, our soldiers when they searched them were giving them back their wallets full of the money they had looted. You know, in Kuwait City, and gave them the Rolex watches back they had stolen and so forth. And they just started to weep. You know, but then what happened after that? Hundreds came forward uh, to, to to surrender to us. Uh, or, over the next several hours. So I, I think you're absolutely right. The psychological dimension of war is so important to understand on so many different levels, right? It's it's all about the will to fight. And and I think the, the Ukrainians were quite w wise to do what they did, Neil, you know, is to, is to ensure discipline and humane treatment. Uh, and, mm -hmm. and of course, that's a sign of professionalism. I mean, the fact that the Russians are recruiting prisoners, uh, I mean, rumored to be about 28,000 of them, to fill their ranks just shows how how the Russians don't understand what fighting power comes from. It comes from you know professional forces that are committed to one another and committed to the mission that have a high degree of cohesion and affection for one another, really, uh, and and are, are are bound by a warrior ethos uh, that includes really a commitment to trying to make war less inhumane uh, by by dis, by by really. You know, the, adhering to St. Thomas Aquinas's principles of, of juice and bellow, right? Of of discrimination and 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 uh, and proportionality and so forth. So so anyway, I I do I do think the human and psychological and emotional dimension of this war uh, is something that ought to be instructive uh, to all of us. Mm -hmm. Neil, a question to you from Nate in Denver. He writes, in your book, The Square and the Tower, you outline the network dynamics of Napoleon and the French Revolution. With the increase of seemingly chaotic global networking today, do you anticipate another Napoleon to emerge, albeit at a global level? Well, that's a great question, uh, Nate. The argument, for those who haven't read the book, uh, was that in the late 18th century, there uh, were two great revolutions, uh, one, of course, in Britain's North American colonies, the other later in in France, and these revolutions represented the triumph of relatively decentralized networks of people with revolutionary ideas over rigid hierarchies uh, that proved to be quite weak when they came into contact with these networks. The American Revolution turned out remarkably well, better than most revolutions, and that revolutionary network quite quickly established a stable constitutional and social order. In France, things didn't go so well, uh, the revolution descended uh, into terror, partly because a much greater military effort was made to defeat the revolution than was made by Britain in its American colonies. And the escalation of, of war and its economic consequences led to a radicalization of the revolution. Out of the chaos of the 1790s, there emerged uh, a heroic uh, military leader who within a matter of, of years, was able to impose his personal authority and essentially establish uh, an empire uh, in, in, uh, in France, which was in many ways more of a, a centralized hierarchy than the old regime uh, had been. So that's the, that's the story. Could it all play out in a similar way today is a, a great question. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that the, the recurrent problem for republics through history has been, and this is one of the most ancient bits of political wisdom, uh, that the populace, the masses, can become disenchanted with the elites and the constitutional order, and they look to a demagogue uh, to prioritize equality over liberty. This is a, a kind of recurrent leitmotif and in Western history. It's something that preoccupied Renaissance thinkers. It was a great preoccupation of the founders uh, of the United States. And mm -hmm. they carefully designed the American Constitution so that it would be hard for anyone to do a Napoleon. People worry- Or, or, to, do, or do, to do a Cromwell, I might add, which was foremost on their minds, right? Of course. And, yeah. and so it, in many ways, the American Constitution is a great product of applied history. It's very clear. Uh, the Federalist Papers make this ab abundantly clear that there's a great deal of thought going into how to avoid that happening 
to this new republic that's being created. And because I think they did their job very well, I've been inclined to doubt those who have said ad nauseum since around 2015 that tyranny is coming to the United States and uh, and Donald Trump is the figure who's going to uh, sweep away the Constitution and establish some kind of, uh, well, if not Napoleonic, then certainly some kind of uh, despotic rule. I'm, I'm doubtful about that. Um, I, and it didn't, of course, happen, despite the alarms and excursions of, of January uh, the 6th last year. If one takes a global view, how is it going for those people who already have centralized power? How is it going for Xi Jinping? How is, how is it going for Vladimir Putin? I mean, mm. the tyrants are not actually having great success at the moment. Or, and if or President takes... Raisi and the supreme leader in Iran, as we're talking, Neil, which... which right. uh, in yeah, fact, we have, you know, exactly. All yeah. of these more or less aligned, uh, uh, and I say more or less aligned because they seem less and less aligned at the moment with every passing week. All of these more or less aligned authoritarian regimes are actually faring pretty badly, whether you look at it economically or in terms of how they've handled the pandemic. So my sense is that the world is still a world that favors decentralization over centralization and network societies over hierarchical uh, rigidly hierarchical orders. I'm, I'm in that sense, uh, an optimist about where we're going. All right, Neil, let's stay with you. I'm going to fold two questions. The one here first, a question from C in the UK, maybe it's Charles, uh, who writes, quote, when you ask a GOP member to name their favorite leaders, Thatcher and Churchill always come up. CNN and Fox News have covered Elizabeth II's death far more than any recent US president. Is the UK really a foreign nation or some sort of 51st state? And this question from Brenda de Bogota, Neil, with the new British sovereign on the throne, what sort of probability do you give to Australia becoming a republic inside the next 10 years? If that were to happen, what consequences would you envisage for the Commonwealth in the UK? Well, see, it's felt more in the last 10 days uh, that the United States is drifting back into uh, the realm of uh of British rule. It reminds me of that great song in Hamilton, You'll Be Back. Uh, <laughs> never have I seen American commentators drool quite so uncontrollably over a, a scene of monarchical pageantry right. as they did as they watched the admittedly spectacular funeral uh, for Her Majesty the Queen. So it's not so much the 51st state, it's more You'll Be Back. Uh, <laughs> I think we're seeing here. Uh, the power of monarchy as an institution. If you take uh, the institution of the head of state and you effectively divorce uh, it from politics uh, and then allow uh, the office to be held for 70 years by a woman of unimpeachable integrity and authority, uh, your, your constitutional order will be in great shape because uh, the rough and tumble of politics is taking place elsewhere uh, the continuity of institutions uh, becomes part and parcel of, of, of a non-political institution in the form of the monarchy. Uh, and this has been such a great advertisement for the monarchy that I think Republicans all over the Commonwealth, including in Australia, uh, must be feeling as if their prospects are distinctly dim. There are a few uh, noises coming from the Caribbean uh, to the effect that now she's gone, we'll have a republic, please. I can't see that taking off uh, in Australia, unless, of course, Charles III proves as uh, inept as, as Charles I, which I don't think he will. HR, two questions for you. First, Scotty and Wake Forest, who writes, I'd like to ask HR McMaster what he believes are the long-term consequences and ramifications of the botched Afghanistan withdrawal. Did the morale military take a hit and could that possibly affect future military readiness? And how has the Afghanistan withdrawal affected America's relationships with our allies one year later? Yeah, well, I, th I think it's profound. And I think we, we, have, we have not paid enough attention to the consequences of the surrender to a terrorist organization and the disastrous withdrawal. And I think that, of course, we, we, we're not even paying attention to the, to the severe humanitarian consequences uh, that, that are connected to Taliban rule, right? There's, there's this idea, well, maybe we should provide some more assistance to Afghanistan. But if that assistance is used by the Taliban to perpetuate their, their staying in power, then, then we've done nothing really to ameliorate 
the, uh, the humanitarian catastrophe. But that humanitarian catastrophe is going to bleed over into a security problem. We've already seen that with the complete intertwined nature of the Taliban and other terrorist organizations, including inclu- including Al Qaeda. You know, with the you know, with the the killing of Zawahiri. Uh, and we, we, it's important to remember that there already are about 22, 23 U.S. designated terrorist organizations in that region. Uh, all of which we think already are a threat to us. And when they have a safe haven support base, the ability to generate revenue from the narcotics trade and other means, they become much, much more dangerous, as we learned the hard way you know, on, on 9-11. And as we learned when ISIS took over, you know, a huge swath of territory in Syria and, and Iraq in, in 2014. So so we, we are in for, I think, a security crisis. But I think uh, what is really important is to recognize the degree to which Uh, There are now doubts about America's staying power and our reliability uh, as a partner and an ally. And I think you see this in the hedging behavior of India, for example, uh, vis-a-vis the the most recent crisis. And I do believe you can draw a direct line, direct line from the catastrophe in in Afghanistan. And as that was occurring just over a year ago, uh, you also had at the same time Vladimir Putin published his 7,000 word essay saying, hey, Ukraine's not even a thing. You know, when telegraphing the renewed uh, assault on, on Ukraine that, that began on February 24th of, of this year. So anyway, I, I think your viewer is quite right uh, that there are significant consequences to that to that to that uh, surrender and withdrawal. And I think we're just beginning really to to kind of uh, to, to understand the nature of, of those consequences. Mm-hmm. For those keeping a score at home, the score is now historians, two economists, one. We are joined by John Cochran. John, two questions for you to get you in the game here. First, a letter from John in Chicago. I don't know if that's a relation of yours. Who writes, quote, there's a lot of discussion among economists, politicians, the media about inflation right now. A lot of the discussion involves placing blame and making excuses. In the current discussions, I have not heard Milton Friedman's name mentioned. Dr. Friedman famously said that inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. He also talked about how politicians will always blame, quote, greedy businessmen and, quote, price gouging for inflation. Have Dr. Friedman's theories on monetary economics been discredited, or are we just hearing the same old nonsense from politicians, the media, and many economists? Well, we're certainly hearing a lot of the same old nonsense, and I hope my historian friends here will chime in. On, on the same uh, search, the same witch hunts that I'm sure Emperor Diocletian went after, uh, greed, uh, middlemen, price gougers. Usually it ends, it ends the, those witch hunts end worse than ours now. The great chicken monopoly, I thought that was fun. The dog ate my homework. Putin's price hike, remember to capitalize that, all, all this stuff. And that is certainly uh, as ridiculous now as it ever was. Uh, Friedman got a lot right. <laughs> and in particular, his dictum, that if, if you want inflation, just print money, throw it from helicopters, and you'll get inflation. And I think that's basically what our government did in the pandemic and continues to do. There's some uh, more subtle issues about does it matter whether you throw money or government debt from helicopters? Does it follow that you can control inflation by soaking up money and issuing lots more government debt that people still don't know how it's going to get repaid? And there, I think we're adding a lot of asterisks to Friedman. But you know, we added New, uh, Einstein added asterisks to Newton, and that didn't mean Newton was entirely a bad guy. Mm-hmm. Okay, Neil, you want to jump in on that? You know, I think this is one of these occasions when a heresy, modern monetary theory, lasts even less time than its critics foresaw. It doesn't seem that long ago that people like Stephanie Kelton were proclaiming a new era in which there were really no limits uh, to the amount that the government could borrow and a central bank uh, could print. And inflation came along even faster than I foresaw uh, to expose the weakness of this so-called theory. Uh, The question that's interesting right now, and I'd be keen to hear John's thoughts, is just how much pain will it take to bring inflation back down? The big event of the late summer was uh, Jay Powell, the Fed chair, emerging as the reincarnation of Paul Volcker with his remarkably brief uh, statement at Jackson Hole. Seems he threw the script away and wrote a much shorter, punchier version in which he essentially said, inflation's the, the mandate and I'll do whatever it takes to bring it back down. But what we don't know is just how much pain that's going to involve. If if one looks back at the record of Paul Volcker and the Fed in the 70s and early 80s, it was a lot of pain. 
uh, mm-hmm. that was necessary to get inflation expectations back down. So I think the big question, and investors are clearly asking that question more and more these days, is how hard are we going to hit? Because the soft landing's clearly not happening. How hard is the hard landing going to be, John? Um, you brought up so many good points. Quickly, uh, yes, uh, MMT uh, got put to its experiment and quickly failed. But also, uh, somewhat to the right of MMT, there was a lot of opinion among mainstream economists that government debt doesn't matter, yeah. interest rates will be low forever. Uh, the central problem of the economy is lack of demand, secular stagnation. What we need to do is just borrow tons and send it out as checks, and that is the key to prosperity. That all just hit a big brick wall of reality. Uh, which I don't think we've, or clearly we haven't recognized. We are, um, as you point out, different than Friedman's time. Inflation is clearly now a fiscal phenomenon. Uh, Friedman wrote, uh, he emphasized the monetary part because in his era, the idea that government would, would pay back its debts seemed pretty reasonable. There was always that asterisk in Friedman's writing. By the way, you have to have a solvent government, but we're now facing uh, an inflation driven by fiscal policy, at least I think. And that uh, the Fed cannot undo all by itself. We've got to fix the fiscal policy. Now that has both good and bad news. Um, there have been times when inflation has ended painlessly. You said necessary to Volcker. Uh, and I don't, it, is, it is not necessary to do that. Many other times uh, inflation has ended quickly when you get the expectations down by other means. And particularly by the means of saying, hey, we fixed our fiscal policy. That's how the hyperinflations of World War I after World War I were ended. Fix the fiscal policy, inflation goes away instantly, no recession, no period of high interest rates. You can do it. But the inflation targeting countries did it. But that takes a fiscal reform, a pro growth microeconomic reform, all that stuff that's hard to do. And uh, I, that's really why I, I, I think we'll have a, we're in for a period of the Fed raising interest rates more and more until inflation finally goes down and that will cause pain. HR, you referenced Iran a, a while ago. We have this question from Maraz in Iran who writes, why does the US government not support the real opposition in Iran, such as Prince Reza Pavlavi, who seeks to overthrow the mullahs? The people of Iran are chanting for him and he wants to restore normal life, freedom and liberal democracy to the country. Well, I mean, obviously it's gonna be up to Iranians to decide how they're governed. I, I do think that the idea that the supreme leader and and uh, and and the revolution re- revolutionary leadership who surrounds him and the Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps and the security apparatus that they've established, the you know the 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 you know the modern day brown shirts in the form of the Basij, uh, that that is a stable regime. It's it's not a stable regime, and and I think it's past time, obviously, for the Iranian people to end their suffering really at the hands of of this uh, of this theocratic dictatorship. And, you know, it, of course, we all know that Iran is a country with tremendous promise, tremendous natural resources, a rich culture. And, and so, you know, how long will the Iranian people put up uh, with this regime? And, of course, we, we saw the, the recent, you know, horrible killing uh, of a woman for, for not adhering uh, to, to, the, uh, to, to, the, to the address. This is uh, Masha Amini. We should all learn her name. Uh, and there are protests that are occurring in the northwest of the country where she's from, a predominantly Kurdish region, but but also in Tehran, where women have taken off the hijab and 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 and, and are chanting against against the regime. And you know, of course, we've seen other mass protests in Iran. All of them have been put down brutally. Uh, but but I think there is growing dissatisfaction uh, with this theocratic dictatorship, the supreme leader, Amini. Uh, and this guy Raisi, who's about to come to the UN General Assembly, and is a war criminal. I mean, he he sat as a judge uh, on a, on a panel that uh, that that sentenced thousands of Iranians to death by hanging or, or firing squad. So so I think it's past time for us to pull the curtain back on this regime, you know, and voice support for the Iranian people. And certainly, as a first step, we ought to stop supplicating to them um, in, in this forlorn. Uh, effort to resurrect a, a, a nuclear deal that would be a bad deal uh, for 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 everybody. So um, I, I think I, I appreciate the viewer's question. Uh, mm-hmm. Of course, it's up to the Iranian people, but we ought to support them in any way we can. Two questions for the group. First, Mauricio in Brazil writes, when times are uncertain and troubled in order to organize ideas or to search for inspiration, do any of you go to a specific thinker and why? Neil? Well, I often turn when I'm seeking inspiration to the great philosophers of history. Now, the philosophy of history isn't something that's actually 
taught anymore. I can't think of of any major university that now has a course in the philosophy of history. And, and this is, I think, a tremendous omission because you can't do history if you don't understand the discipline that you're trying to practice. Uh, in fact, I find myself uh, just a few days ago drawing up a, a syllabus, a kind of ideal course in philosophy of history, if I were to teach uh, such a thing. The scholar I come back to very often is the great Oxonian archaeologist and philosopher R.G. Collingwood, a name that one rarely hears these days. But Collingwood uh, was a profound thinker about the nature of historical inquiry. He said, what we try to do as historians is to reconstitute past thought. We try to reimagine how it was to be an actor in the past on the basis of what evidence survives. And then he said, we juxtapose that reimagined thought with our own experience. And it's that juxtaposition of past and present that is central to the historical activity. Collingwood has been a great guide uh, since I fully discovered his work, which was about 10 years ago. And if there's one book I, I highly recommend, it's a delightful book. It's his autobiography published just before World War II. Mm -hmm. HR, where do you go for inspiration? Well, I'll, I'll tell you, for, in military history, I think you have to acknowledge uh, Michael Howard in, in terms of, uh, of really the, 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 the most prominent uh, modern military historian. You can't go wrong reading anything he's written. If you're just starting to read his, his essays and books, I, I think uh, I think read his long essay, "The Use and Abuse of Military History," which is a great way uh, to to instructive in terms of how to think about about war and and warfare. And then on modern philosophy, as you know, I'm a big fan of G.K. Chesterton. You know, I think you can't you can't go wrong with uh, Chesterton and just his humor, his 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 uh, self. Um, you know, self-deprecating, you know, sense of, of humor as he's imparting important insights and, and lessons, I think is unmatched. And and then, you know, in terms of ancient philosophy, I, I'm a big fan of the Stoic philosophers. Epictetus, as as, as Jim Stockdale was, who was when, when he was at Hoover and and helped him get through his difficult experiences as a prisoner of war. But I just I just think the Stoic philosophers help us understand that if we focus on what we can control. We can make we can make a big difference, and and I think that that sense of agency and that sense of stoicism, right, getting through difficult times, is quite relevant to our our times today. John, I assume you're going to say Paul Krugman. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> Although sometimes sometimes great wisdom is come like my dog. If you want to know how to get somewhere, uh, which direction she chooses, and go the opposite direction, you always get exactly where you want to go. Uh, um, so, uh, yeah, I, I'm inspired by a great um, conservative political philosophers. I don't know much use for philosophy itself. And, of course, the, the Hayek, the Friedman, the Soul, the, the architects of the, the philosophy, if you will, of um, freedom <laughs> in its economic and, and political forms. Uh, but I want to I say something against philosophy. Um, if you want to understand physics, you don't go back and read Newton in the original Latin. You read a modern textbook. And there is something to the fact that real, the durable wisdom is that which has been rethought and distilled down and doesn't require you to go back to the, to the basic original. So I'm, I'm more of a pragmatist than a scientific outlook I'd like to bring to economics uh, than, than spending too much time with, the, you know, understanding the, the, the ancients and, and what they had to say. This question from Aaron in Denver, Colorado, who writes, please name your top liberal historian, economist, military leader, and respectable host for a hypothetical podcast you'd enjoy hearing. Neil, who's the historian you tap? Did I hear that it had to be a liberal historian? Well, he qualified liberal, so go with that or freelance if you want. Well, well how, <laughs> what does the word liberal mean? <laughs> now we can have some fun. Yeah, this does, this does pose a... a, a a challenge if we're restricting the list to to liberals only, but maybe I'll interpret uh, the the term liberal in its uh, old fashioned yes. uh, uh, sense rather than in its contemporary American sense of uh, a member or operative of the Democratic Party. Uh, so if we're looking for a, a liberal historian, uh, somebody who is uh, a global in in uh, perspective, uh, uh, scholarly. Uh, in method, but in insightful in presentation. I, I'm a big fan of Peter Frankopan. It's a bit of an Oxonian uh, episode we're having here. We keep coming back to Oxford, but uh, uh, Peter is the author of a brilliant book, The Silk Roads 
Uh, he's a professor at Oxford, and uh, I'm sure he'd be a liberal uh, because you can't be a conservative at Oxford anymore. And so I'll name him. Okay. HR military leader? Gosh, um, you know, it, it's tough to just pick one, right? But I mean, how, how do you not pick George Washington, right? I mean, you know, in terms of he's really the, 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 the duress that he was under and, and uh, <laughs> the, the difficulties that he encountered and and how he persevered, you know, and and won our nation's independence, you know, tough to tough act to follow. Uh, if if I just go era by era, I would say in the 19th century, uh, Ulysses S. Grant, uh, I think for the same kind of reasons, you know, and and then in World War II, you could pick a number of leaders, but I do think that the framework to apply to them is the, what Clausewitz said about military genius, that that uh, you know that that military genius requires courage, intellect, and determination. And I think that's a, still a good framework to evaluate military leadership. Courage, physical certainly, but but moral courage is maybe even more important and and and, and more difficult quality. Uh, intellect, right? Because you, you want military leaders who see opportunities where most people only see difficulties, and they have to apply their imagination to difficult problems. I mean, um, and and uh, and then and then determination, right? Because you know, an activity that involves killing and the prospect of death is is hard and. And difficult uh, from an emotional psychological perspective, and and you need you need military commanders who who are determined uh, to achieve an outcome worthy of the sacrifices that their soldiers and servicemen and women are making. John, an economist. Well, the game here got uh, got twisted once we brought in George Washington. I don't think he was a particular liberal. Uh, I, I enjoy the uh, the current debate. Again, I'm I'm kind of more in current rather than class. Which is if you kind of bring back Keynes or something of the sort, then he's going to be spouting off stuff that makes no sense whatsoever. I mean, in just terms of the English language and in terms of our modern understanding of how things work. So, it, you know, it might be a pleasant afternoon, but I don't think we learn much. Uh, I enjoy uh, back and forth with uh, the current, you know, really good uh, um, Larry Summers, um, Olivier Blanchard, Jason Furman, I'll mention. He's a, a good, young, policy oriented economist full of facts. Uh, calls himself liberal and, and Democrat. So, uh, you know, when you argue with people like that, it's it's not just, oh, you heartless, whatever. Uh, it's, uh, you know, uh, facts and causal mechanisms and years of theories uh, come to the fore. And that's the kind of discussion I enjoy. Well, I well my to... favorite economist is John Cochran, you know, because actually, you know, contrary to his moniker, he's, he's huggy more than he is grumpy, I think. Very huggy guy. Well, that's, 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 I, I there's nothing the, hug, I, the huggy economist is what we I were like asked to, to name yeah. liberals HR. <laughs> yeah, but I was gonna I was gonna name Adam well, Smith then, because we have to have at least one person on this podcast with a very cool accent. Yeah, yeah, but, but liberal in the sense of freedom, absolutely in the nineteenth yeah. century sense. Let's bring on Adam Smith and say, you know, ba basically you figured it all out. And we're just cleaning up behind you, guy, and and he might. <laughs> I really would love to see the smile on his face. I don't think he had any idea what, what he said forth. But I will say, I, I enjoy- I'm glad to hear that you're still reading some classic texts, John. <laughs> you know, uh, again, uh, don't read Smith in the original unless you want, if you want to do history of thought, fine. But you know, the the, the modern version is is much cleaner and the equations help a lot. I must I deplore I this. I must me. deplore this whole uh, <laughs> turn that the conversation has taken. If there's one thing I have learned, John Cochran, over the years, Cochran. it is that Cochran. the world is full of people pretending to have read things on the basis of cliff notes and nearly always garbling the original. When one goes back to the original, and I can remember going back and reading uh smith recently reading the theory of moral sentiments mm -hmm. not only do you realize what he was really saying but it's also much better than the cliff notes <laughs> you can tell by the way you've touched your nerve when neil really starts going to deep scott on you so uh viewers fewer, know that <laughs> hey uh choice for a moderator a host i think there's an obvious one steve kotkin here at the hoover institution uh he is personable he's bright he's brilliant and you can't be a show call, called goodfellas without at least one guy who could do a good joe pesci imitation but is he? Oh, God. yeah, he's so good. Yep. I mean, I mean, and he's a brilliant guy, and he's just fun to be around. You know. Yeah, I agree, gentlemen. I have in my possession lightning round questions. We have only a couple minutes to go here, so it's blast through these really quick. Uh, Neil, we got this from Sven in Sweden, uh, who writes: What is the most significant mistake or missed opportunity for American foreign policy since 1914, and why? Well, Philip Zelikow would say the missed opportunity came just two years later, when uh, the United States could have brought the First World War to a premature end if Woodrow Wilson and his advisor, Colonel House, had only been smarter. Um, I'll take you up to the more uh, recent past. 
and say that there was a huge uh, missed opportunity in the mid 1960s when uh, if uh, Lyndon Johnson and the best and the brightest had only listened uh, to the realists, they could have got themselves out of Vietnam rather than escalating the war there. Perhaps the single biggest strategic blunder in modern American history was escalation in Vietnam in the mid-1960s. That was avoidable. Mm -hmm. Uh, John, we got a note from David in North Carolina who writes, if you were to recommend to younger Americans one foreign language to study, which would it be? Italian, of course, most beautiful one around. <laughs> Neil, John, what would you recommend for a language? Oh, um, Russian. Russian. HR? Well, I, I would say Japanese. <laughs> because I do think that that relationship is becoming more important than, than ever. HR, this from Liam in Perth, Australia, who writes, how likely is it that Israel will go top gun three and strike Iran's nuclear facilities? What effect will this have for the rest of the world? I think it's quite likely, actually, uh, that, 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 uh, that Israel will attack through multiple means uh, the, the, the Iran's nuclear missile programs. And I think because they'll do that because it is an existential threat to Israel. All you have to do is you know, look at this this recent you know CBS interview with with uh, you know President Raisi of Iran uh, as he as he denied the Holocaust uh, and 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 look at his previous statements about you know Iran using the term that the the, the Iranians do uh, regarding regarding Israel as a, as a cancerous boil right so I think that the Begin doctrine is still in effect uh, which means that Israel will take any means necessary to prevent a hostile state from gain, getting access to the most destructive weapons on earth. And so I, I think the chances are quite high. Mm -hmm. Neil, this from John of Melbourne, Australia, who writes, why does GCCP restrain itself from fully supplying and supporting Putin? And what can be done to further this restraint? It's a great question. That's the most important feature of the war in Ukraine, the lack of Chinese support for the Russian war effort. It'd be a very different story if uh, this was a proxy war on both sides. I think the reason is clear. Uh, the, the National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan said if Chinese entities support the Russian war effort in contravention of the sanctions we've imposed, we will impose secondary sanctions on those entities. And the Chinese got that message, which tells you that their relationship with the United States matters more to them than their relationship with Russia. And it certainly does economically when you take a look at it. Uh, and this is why I think uh, Putin is ultimately doomed, because he doesn't have uh, China behind him the way Ukraine has the United States behind it. Mm -hmm. And finally, this question from Mary in Kennett Square, Pennsylvania. HR, I think that's near your old stomping grounds of Philadelphia. Uh, she writes, why is it that every fellow I follow is not only brilliant, but wise and seemingly quite amicable? Victor Davis Hanson, for example. I welcome any all of you to jump in with the humble brag. Look, you know, does somebody say Victor's amicable? I mean, he's my favorite <laughs> curmudgeon, man. I mean, I love so many things about Victor, but I would not call him like amicable. I mean, I so yeah. but, hey, I'll say I'll just say I'll just say Hoover is the, a great place to be. I feel so fortunate to be able to be with you, Bill and and Neil and John and our colleagues. It's a place really in contrast to many places in, in the country where we have meaningful, respectful discussions. We can disagree with one another. Uh, and, and we obviously we care deeply about the future of, of our nation and and, uh, and and work together to try to generate the ideas that define a free society. So what, what better job could you have? And so that's why I think we, you know, we're just so fortunate to be at a, at a great institution and in, in very good company every day. Here's John, you got a big smile on your face. Economists will answer selection bias. We hire people like that. <laughs> okay. I think, I think our, our, our listener is just following very selectively. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, gentlemen, we're going to have to uh, end it there, but uh, thank you for participating. And to thank all of you who bothered to write into us. If we didn't get to your letter, uh, my apologies. Just simply too many questions, not enough time, but we'll do it again soon if you'd like. So that's it for this episode of Goodfellows. We will be back in a matter of days, not weeks or months. So fear not. If you want to make sure you don't miss the show, subscribe to us and rate us. Give us a nice review while you're at it. And if you also want to keep track of HR, Neil and John, sign up for Hoover's Daily Report, which uh, anytime they are published, anytime they're in the news, it gets in the Daily Report, it'll show up in your inbox. On behalf of the Hoover Goodfellows, Neil Ferguson, HR McMaster, John Cochran, all of us here at the Hoover Institution, hope you enjoyed today's show. We'll see you soon. Take care. If you enjoyed this show and are interested in watching more content featuring H.R. McMaster, watch Battlegrounds, also available at hoover.org.